We made this. Hello and welcome to Pick a Disc. I am your host, Matt Latham, and you're listening to the podcast where someone picks a disc to talk about for whatever reason they want to. And I'm recording this on New Year's Day of 2024, so Happy New Year at the time of recording. Um, yeah, so naturally, I've had a bit of cold and it's still niggling my throat, which is probably why I feel it sound a bit um, huskier than normal. The usual jokes about me sounding better than normal still apply. Anyway, this week slash fortnight in the middle of this January where there's stuff happening all the time because of the birthday of the podcast and of the podcast network this is another episode so this is an episode with ralph and ben from to Killer king and they're going to be talking about daisies of the galaxy by eels talk about songs talk about the album talk about mark e or whatever his name is no the usual stuff it's a good kind it's a good chat it's a very interesting chat um I'm really nice to just see Ben and Ralph just like chat about an album that they've got shared interest in and yeah it's just a really really good conversation so if you're listening listening to this for the first time hello um you can follow us on all the on all the social medias under pick a disc there's a discord server link in the show notes as always and yeah if you just want to say hello say hello yep so I'm just going to press play on the interview and we'll talk to Ralph and Ben yeah, just very much randomly, just before we start recording, um, almost almost had my other podcast derailing the conversation with me because <laughs> I was pretty much because I was pretty much where Ralph is now about a month ago to at a uh, adventure game convention, but uh, <laughs> so but I'm not going to get I'm not going to let um, the other podcast as much as it excites me to talk about adventure game. I'm not going to go and talk about that. But I'm here with two guests actually, so um, it's a a rare occasion where I've got two people talking about the same album. So I've got Ben Jackson and Ralph Pellimenta from To Kill a King with me. So how you doing? How you both doing? Yeah. Your two worlds was about to collide a moment ago. <laughs> exactly, yes. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, very exciting. Um, yeah, well, thanks for having us on. Yeah. Yeah, we're doing well, thanks. We're, yeah. we're about 200 and odd miles apart from each other, but, well, I mean, I speak for myself when I say I'm doing all right. <laughs> I haven't yeah. actually asked Ralph. Oh, other than the distance between us, Ben, I'm doing yeah. fine. <laughs> <laughs> You've got a nice, I'm going to say, isosceles triangle of, uh, of positions yeah. if you try and drag like So, yeah, so we've got uh, Ben all the way in Cornwall, Ralph all the way in London, and me all the way in Birmingham, um, <laughs> South Birmingham. Yeah, the, the band's been um, really spread thin over the world recently, but this is now the closest... I think we've been in a while. So the best player has been in New Zealand up until a couple of weeks ago or something like that. But we're all mm-hmm. uh, relo- relocated and, and getting ready uh, to do some more music together. So, yeah. Yeah, okay, yeah. So, um, yeah, we'll have a brief chat about about that a bit later on. But, uh, yeah, but there's been, this is um, Piggy This Podcast. Um, we don't, I don't want to talk about you. We want to talk about something else. No. Yeah, fair enough. <laughs> we're here to talk about... Uh, we'll talk about album. bigger, better bands. That's what we want. <laughs> <laughs> Not my words. <laughs> but no, we're here to talk about um, an album, an album that you've both picked to talk about. Ben, Ralph, why don't you introduce and tell the listeners the disc that we've talked, we're going to talk about today? I was going to say how panicky I got when we had to pick, you know, an album. Because, like, I always find my brain just freezes. You know, when someone goes, like, pick your top five or whatever, I sort of panic. Or even, like, what you sort of listening to recently. And I think being a musician, there's all that extra pressure. And then when it was that we both had to pick one. I was like, this is going to take forever. But it actually was really painless and quite quick, wasn't it, Ben? It was, yeah. 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 Um, me and Ralph, uh, despite being in the same band for over 10 years, um, the the Venn diagram of like what uh, artists and albums that we like, both, we've got like, we've got quite a lot of stuff that we both like. But mm-hmm. the, in terms of like stuff that we both love, um, it's actually quite a sort of small little bit of overlap. Um, and uh, this album, um, which shall I reveal what it is now? Yeah, go on. We tease yes. them up. They're going to so, be, <laughs> be on the edge of their seat. They'll be like, uh, oh, God. So, yeah, the album is called Daisies of the Galaxy by Eels. 
Um, and yeah, this this album sort of came up quite quickly, I think, when we were trying to think of what. Yeah, I mean, it kind of in in the way that we have different mu- music tastes. I kind of feel like this one, yeah, fits right in the middle of. Um, it's got sort of like some very very good uh, songwriting lyrics, all that sort of stuff, and sort of like back to basic songwriting. Um, a lot of country sort of influences, but then also he's very happy to go off into his sort of um, sort of soundscapey samples, that sort of weird world. Um, and he's quite happy in both. And yeah, and I think that kind of that sums us up a little bit. Okay, so what, so what is it about the album that you both kind of like? And did you find, do you know what the overlap of interest is between you two with the album? Yeah, I mean, so for me, it was quite a sort of formative um, album. I think there were a few bands that sort of came around in my sort of teenage years where it was a bit of the sort of DIY musicians where they were definitely recording in their basement and that sort of thing. So you've got like, um, so you've got Eels, like Beck, um, Badly Drawn Boy, that sort of thing. And that sort of, oh, like Gomez, all sort of came out at a similar sort of time. And it kind of just felt like it was probably when I started recording myself, like in in my sort of bedroom. And it kind of felt like, oh, you can actually, this is accessible to me. Do you know what I mean? And I can I can start imitating this sort of thing. Um, not that they're not amazing musicians, but they're not kind of on that sort of um, the other sort of stuff before that that I was listening to a bit was um, more stuff like Hendrix and Steve Vai and like very much like technical guitarists and that sort of stuff. So. Yeah, the bar is set a little bit lower with these guys, but in a in a wonderful way. Um, yeah, and um, yeah, Ben, what about you? Yeah, I think for me it's is yeah, it also quite a formative album for me. Um, I think the first Eels record, uh, I'm not sure. It was, I think it is their first album. Maybe they've got like one small one. The first one really that broke through was called Beautiful Freak, and they had like a couple of radio singles off that. And that was kind of bought. My parents got it. Um, I don't know whether it was my mum or dad, but they they bought it. And I don't think they were really into it. But I sort of took it up to my bedroom and uh, experimented with it. And uh, yeah, really, really got into it. And then I think I went and bought this one afterwards. But yeah, I think it's also it is. I'm I'm quite into just con- like constantly listening to new music and I try not to go back but this is actually an album especially from like my teenage years quite often I will like just like be curious about what an album that I was really into when I was a teenager sounds like and, and stick it on and quite often I will be a bit disappointed or like I'll be like oh well, this is actually not as good as I thought it was but I think this one, there's definitely a couple of tunes on it which I would still like happily. Li- I mean, I'd still happily listen to the whole album through, but there's a few that I would like put up there with my favorite songs, I reckon. Yeah. Well, a couple, yeah. Um, so it's so nice interesting that, it's- that that's your um, philosophy or approach with music, just because it's so different to, I think, um, most people where music can become like a real comfort thing. So mm-hmm. it's like, and the more you listen to it, it's more ingrained. And so like, for me, this is definitely one of those albums where it's like, I know every song and, and to be fair, I'm not like putting it on every week or whatever, but you know what I mean? It's still like in sort of regular rotation because it's, um, it's just very comforting. You know what I mean? Yeah, I was going to say def- comforting is quite a nice uh, description for this album, even though yeah. like, even though some of the songs are pretty sad, um, but yeah, yeah it's, com- it's comforting. It's comforting. Well, I think that's one of the things of like, Probably also because we were listening to it in teenage years, which are like full of, uh, I don't know. I don't want to say like made up drama because it's like dismissive of it. But you know what I mean? Like um, sort of life and death and all that sort of stuff. I think that he does amazing sort of world building where as a teenager, I mean, like even now you kind of want to be in his world. It all sounds very interesting, if very sad. Do you know what I mean? And I think that, that was definitely one of the things you kind of wanted to be in his crew or like doing the stuff he was doing, that sort of thing, um, particularly as a teenager. And um, yeah, and also the way that he kind of does look at, although really sad things uh, going on in his life at this point. So he's like, um, 
his mother's just died of cancer and earlier his his sisters committed suicide so that's kind of what he's working through in this album but he also kind of really shows those sort of the good side of life as well without sort of steering away from the from the really rough stuff as well and i think that's something that really comes through in all his lyrics and like yeah that's why it's sort of always quite comforting in a sort of strange way as you say we'll go back to um talking about the album in a second i want to kind of just loop back a second to kind of do both your personal tastes because you both say you both said that you the venn diagram is very very small (laughs) well well the overlap's very very small so between two so what kind of music are you both into that's quite different then so what what do you think is the unifying factor in this that means you both really connect to it yeah so i mean i i think it's not I well, I don't want to argue with Ben. I don't want us to have a public argument. <laughs> but I don't Not know. If, I don't. I I think it's more like because there are, there are a bunch of bands that we'll definitely sort of agree on, and you know what I mean. Unless you've been lying to me on all those ten years of uh, yeah. of journeys in cars, you know where we've sh- you know that sort of stuff. But I think it's just more like maybe where we're sort of approaching it from. Like I, you, you're like probably you're definitely more into electronic music that sort of stuff than me um and i suppose maybe more weird and wonderful electronic music i'm more likely to listen to sea shanties or people singing folk songs with one finger in their ear that sort of stuff yeah um, but i mean that's kind of painting it as a caricature do you know what i mean like is in it that's like that's taking it to its extremes but i think that will like that gives the idea basically would you agree ben that sort of thing yeah, I'd say like our, um, our, although yeah, I mean very nuanced, etc. But our, basically, our roles in the band in To Kill a King kind of give away like yeah. the 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 like approach. So Ralph's the um, the songwriter, writes all the lyrics, um, you know, and plays acoustic uh, and writes in that way. And I um, I'm the producer, so I've got an ear to like how it's put together. Um, and that sort of ideas on the recording side and Ralph's like much more tuned on to like tuned into lyrics although yeah. definitely obviously we're both like we just love all sort of music so we're both listening to all that stuff but it's just yeah. which where the emphasis is mm. um, yeah that's it it's like, I think that would be the thing of being like it's what turns you on to a song and it's like with me it's more likely to be like melodies and lyrics and with Ben it might be more like the production but with this, um, with this album, I mean, I think it's got it all. The, one of the other things that I love with this one is that in comparison to Beautiful Freak, which is one of his earlier ones, he like, um, he's got, I mean, it starts with that wonderful brass and sort of orchestral moment. And then he keeps on going back to that without losing songs where he's got his old sort of patchwork style. And I think that just shows that sort of confidence and also being able to, pull from both of those worlds which is something that both me and ben love to do as well you know i mean we'll have the odd moment where you get like the sort of um the sort of stinging moment of like strings and stuff but then go back to samples or or something else straight away you know um and i think he's definitely been an influence on us to do that sort of stuff i I, yeah so that's quite that's quite interesting where you said so while you're saying you're kind of more the acoustic singer songwriter side ben you're perhaps more into the kind of electronic sonic sample side um and there's there's a quite interesting hybrid of both of them with days of the galaxy so i think like so i think that's where the Vi- venn diagram kicks in so as yeah. soon as so as soon as you kind of categorize yourselves as like the electronic and the acoustic one that kind of makes sense because there's a very interesting mix of the two of this because um i'll bring up now uh so my history reveals is i knew the name um i i always assumed that eels were a band a lot more contemporary than they actually are so when i first so when i got the email saying oh they're going to talk about eels and stuff and i opened up the wikipedia page because all formed in 1991 i was like what i i assumed there was i assumed there was kind of like mid mid to late naughty so i've always for some reason, I've, it might be just because of the names, but I always thought assumed there was going to be like like foals or something, um, yeah, like and a lot more kind of either kind of indie rock or something like that, or kind of like the clean indie from that, like clean like uh, that kind of indie pop stuff. So I I've always just assumed the name Eels was mm. was that, and then looking into it, realized that I think never came for the soul. I was like, oh, it's them, but I so I was coming in pretty much blind more or less. Um, 
when it's blind. So, yeah, and I, when I first listened to it, I then realised that it sounded very familiar or there was kind of, there's something kind of familiar about it. And then Quick Looking Tune Vine found that it's been in some of the songs on this album that have been in a load of stuff that I've watched. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so it was, yeah, so... They're quite an intimidating band to like to get into. It's kind of like you. Ha- it, it, they're one of those bands that <clears throat> they just release so much music. Mm-hmm. Like they've been cons- consistently releasing music for yeah. like wow, however live. long that is. Um, and like some of the albums are like well. two. Yeah, some of the albums are like double albums and stuff. So if you're not like quite often with bands, I don't know. There's quite a few bands that I feel like I should listen to. And almost, it's almost like this um, with TV programs as well. Like I know that I should watch The Sopranos, but I just know that there's so much of it that it just <laughs> yeah. feels like such an effort to go back. Because I because quite often you want to like you want to start at the beginning and like work your way through with with mm-hmm. bands and things. But if you did that for it with Eels, you'd just be completely lost. There's there's <laughs> there's loads, there's a bunch of bands like that that I'm like I just can't. Um, I don't know if I've got the time to really like get into yeah. them so that i can so for people who are listening who like me perhaps aren't aware as of eels um as eels and and i i this is just a bunch of stuff that i re- learned today when i was doing research for the episode for this episode um so eels is uh eels are an american rock band formed in los angeles in 1991 by singer songwriter and multi-instrumentalist mark oliver everett known by the stage name e uh, band members have changed throughout the years, both in the studio and stage, making Everett the only official member for most of the band's work. Eels music is often filled with themes of family, death and unrequited love. And since 1996, Eels have released 14 studio albums, seven of which were charted in Billboard 2000. How many? 40? 14. 14, okay, yeah, 14. I was going to say. <laughs> oh, the trouble is, though, because you said that, Ben... Yeah. 40 is still really impressive. But <laughs> yeah, it's not bloody 40, is it? <laughs> I thought you said 40. Yeah, oh, oh my gosh. Really, really yeah. easy, isn't it? Um, yeah. Also, I love the. Um, so he's got um, Mr. Mr. E, but his other nickname in the band is uh, The Milkman, which I quite like. <laughs> oh, I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I quite like. I think with the origins, what well, I found listening to the origin story of the band as well is that I think he, was, he started as just a solo artist. As yeah. E, uh, and then I think it was when he started touring and started working with other musicians, he started creating the the, ba- the band Eels. And <laughs> the story of why the name Eels I think is quite funny because they wanted because he wanted something that would be next to E in the like record shops and stuff. Uh-huh. And yeah. then, but then then realised his mistake early on when he realised, oh yeah, there's Eagles, Earth, Wind, and Fire, <laughs> so yeah. the, so they're not going to be next to each other. <laughs> yeah, I think he had like one of those. Um... Like just classic stories. If he got signed really quickly as as E, um, and then the first single did well, and then the second one didn't do well, and then he was suddenly dropped, and then it was like in the wasteland for a little bit before he did um, Eels. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. But, uh, yeah. Yeah. Ma- and Mark Oliver Everett, inter- interesting person actually. When I started reading through stories stuff, and he's, and when listening to say, oh eels are quite known for being for exploring quite dark subjects and being quite depressing and stuff and reading his life story he's actually quite tragic um yeah. and i was just reading it i was like i was like feeling really so i was like going oh, just, someone just needs to give him a hug um but like but is that kind of story stuff because i think he said so yeah, to i think particularly with this album i think his mom passed away from cancer yeah. i believe um, yeah and his his sister had um just committed suicide like yeah basically when he did his first album so um and their dad died when they were all very young when him and his sister were very young so yeah it, it's a life full of tragedies really yeah um, but it's as you say it's the way that he can then i think just weave and talk quite weave those things and talk so honestly in his music that um even when i'm absolutely not entirely certain what a certain lyric means i know that it does have real weight and value to him do you know what i mean it's it's one of those acts that you can just be completely confident in that fact um yeah uh which is it's great it just gives it such gravitas you know i, th- I mean I, it, like, I think tragedy kind of follows him all the time like he's um so his cousin was a flight attendant um on one of the planes that got crashed into the twin towers as well uh wow. yeah so that was um jennifer lewis um it was oh actually it was one that struck the pentagon so um and in his autobiography he does he does muse whether the plane hit his father's old office and he and that's he mentioned that in his autobiography but um so 
there's I think there's a lot of kind of personal kind of don't say the word baggage um history which kind of fuels a kind of a darkness through that and um I I, I read that before I actually listened to the album so because mm. I read it last night and I only really listened to the album perhaps on the on the drive to work this morning um which uh, put me in a good mood for work <laughs> 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 but um but. Uh, well, and I, weirdly, I there's like some. There is something quite hopeful about about a yeah. lot of the songs. There, it's yeah, like it's, it's like, um, especially considering just how like bleak his yeah. life is. That the the arrangements are quite sort of like, I don't know. That th- that threw me. There's like a lightness to it. Uh, yeah. Um. I, some of their al- it, their the, other albums are like you know a lot like grungier and bluesier um, yeah. and angrier actually. But there's not there's not really anger in this record. I don't think. Well, I think there's much. also a bit of a sense of humour in certain lines, and I think as you were talking about this, um, well, you sort of described it as baggage, but this sort of you know the sort of darkness that is there. I don't think he's just putting it on his display. I think he's really trying to work through things. It's almost like a sort of, um, you know, how people quite often talk about their art as being a sort of therapy thing. I think it's really there on display and that he is trying hard to look at the um, the good things in life as well. Um, it's what, you know, as we were saying before, but without trying to sugarcoat it or paint it all as being joyful and stuff, there's these sad things that happen, but life is worthwhile. I think that's what he's sort of getting through, you know? Um, yeah, there's and there's a there's a definite um, not humour, but there's a like a very irreverent kind of point of view. So he's, he's talking about these dark subjects, but there's like a almost a sarcastic nihilist kind of like if you can't if you can't at least try and make light out of something to make think like something on dark subjects or make it like black humor or black comedy yeah, yeah. kind of elements to it. So Absolutely. Like, so the, I like birds one with the, uh, I can't look at the rocket launch, the trophy wives of the astronauts, that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, I think that song in particular was him really trying to find the good and stuff. So his mum apparently was, um, was an avid bird watcher. So the whole, I like birds, that's just him sort of doing a little, um, homage to his mum sort of thing and the joys that she found in life, you know? Um, yeah in fact we did a little cover of that in la didn't we we, we did should... yeah yeah, yeah. um <laughs> god how long ago was that that's that's is it remember that now? Did, uh what when we toured um in america i don't know maybe seven something like seven years ago something like if that. you think it was seven i reckon it was probably nine if you're yeah. fine everything's like yeah <laughs> longer ago than that yeah, yeah um anyway but yeah that was fun um, yeah, that's a that that song. Uh, I, I'm I'm glad that you've. Is that definitely like yeah, what that I song's read, about? Because um, I read a, I read a little bit in his um, what was it called? It was um, things the grand the grandkids should know is his autobiography. Yeah. Um, and there were lots of really, I also mean, one of my favorite he, songs of this. Really, yeah. I I think it's like um, it, so he's in in his autobiography. He you know it's amazing to the way that he talks about the stuff in his songs, like we've been, we've been discussing now about how he can, um, he's kind of working through stuff. I think almost like the autobiography is kind of like the, the sort of a uh, cheat code sort of thing where he kind of like, he lays it all out and yeah, is it maybe even more therapeutic for him and in, in him talking about his life like that and trying to look for the, for the brighter aspects and things. Um, but yeah, that's what that, that song is about. Okay, yeah. Cause that's actually one that me and Mike, my dad used to like discuss oh, yeah. yeah what did what were your well i thought it was like just a song about liking birds um yeah. but my dad's my dad's guess was that he'd like been to america uh, sorry been to england and like heard the phrase that you know british people call women birds and it was kind of like Uh-oh. using like different bits of um uh you know trying to use british slang um yeah no which um which i never believed no. but then but then in the in the chorus there's a lyric which is um uh if if you're it's like if you're small and on a search i well i always used to think it was like i've got a, i've got a feeling for you to uh, i think it's i've got a feeder for you to perch on Right, so I've got a feeder so, for you to perch on, but that I, made me that kind of lends itself to like the women, uh, like I oh, think it's talking about girls. I thing, I but. think you're trying to make a beautiful song about birds. Um, it's filth. a sex song, yeah. I think it's literally 
it's like a bird feeder that the little yeah. bird can perch on. Yeah, I know, but also yeah. saying the yeah, well, saying well, I've got well, a feeder now, for you now to now perch I think you've on. One of my favourite eel songs. <laughs> Disgusting. <Yeah. laughs> Featuring men dressing up as bird <laughs> standing on the corner trying to attract birds along. Yeah. <laughs> Um, um, See, I, I thought, thought it was slightly more explicit then. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Um, there's a, um, there's a, there was another bit in the book actually, which I thought was um, really interesting with the big last song. So, I mean, um, a big song from this album was the Mr. E's Beautiful Blues, which is the very last track. And um, I'll put this forward to you guys because it basically I've always loved it. Like it's, I think it's great. It's a big sort of pop hit. It was a radio hit from us as well. And I always thought it was a genius move to kind of like have this album, which does discuss about all those dark things. But then the very last song is more explicitly him going, um, God damn right, it's a beautiful day. You know what I mean? That sort of thing. And I was like, oh, that's, a, that's an absolute genius move. But then it turns out that he really didn't want it on the album and the record company forced him to put it on the album. So um, he produced it without that track. They were like, we're not releasing this. He started writing for the next album. And then they were like, oh, that song, that's got to go on this. And he just didn't want it. And he even went so far as to make them put like this 20 seconds of silence before it comes on. And to be like, this is not associated with it at all. But it's so interesting because, you, I mean, you hear so many times of like record companies coming in and like doing stuff and the artist hates it. But I'm like, for me this really makes that album. Do you know what I mean? And the last couple of songs in a row, and I know this is a song that we've, um, this an album that we picked being like our favorite sort of thing, but re-listening to it, there's like about two or three before you hit this final one that kind of, for me, it's a bit of a lull in the album. Do you know what I mean? And I think without it and ending on that high, I'd probably have quite a different opinion of it. So yeah, I was just wondering your guys' thoughts on that, knowing that the artist really didn't want it. You know what I mean? Yeah, because I, I, I had a feeling that when on the original release, I'm not, it might even have been, it felt like it was, you know how on CDs they used to have like hidden tracks? That's what he um, wanted to feel like. Yeah, he said yeah. like, yeah. So yeah, I, I, that's what I thought it was. And and the mm. name and like the name is a little bit like ambiguous. Um, yeah. It doesn't, doesn't really mention, it doesn't even say, sound like a blues song, but it's called Mr. E's Beautiful Blues. Yeah. Um, if people haven't heard the song, you probably have heard it because I think it was picked up by Shrek. I think it was like, I think it's in a Sh Shrek, in Shrek, Shrek two did, or something. There's like a version I think of Shrek it. Did my my beloved monster? Um, may, uh, it, it's yeah, probably maybe. used on a bunch of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, yeah, they definitely did my beloved monster, but um, yeah. I feel, I, yeah, I feel like it might be used somewhere. Anyway. Yeah. It's quite. It, it, you probably recognise it from somewhere. Um, it was a hit, but yeah, I know what you mean. I I felt like I'd sort of discovered it when I, when I heard it, even though yeah, you know, I felt like it was a little discovery at the end of the album, which probably mm -hmm. made me like it. Um, yeah, there is one of those. I, I know what you mean. That there is a couple of sort of songs at the end which I wasn't as into, and in fact, one of them, like I it. Had, when I listened back to it, I was like, I, "This must have been one that I skipped uh, because I didn't, I didn't, didn't think you'd heard I didn't it remember before. it." Yeah, um, but uh, definitely, there's one. One of the last two, I think, I was listening earlier is "Wood and Nickels," which oh, that's a great one, which yeah. I think is really good. Yeah. Um, I think there's a couple more after that before we hit Miss. I mean, not I, we shouldn't focus on those ones if they were both, but you know what I mean. If we're doing them, but I just think that without having that one at the end. I think it would really change my perception of it. Do you know what I mean? Um, there's a there's a couple ones that I've sort of like um, sort of singled out as being ones to like that really speak to me. You know what I mean? Um, one of them is that Genie's Diary. Because uh, I love the sort of again going back to it hitting you in your sort of teenage years and him sort of vocalizing that sort of stuff. It's like. Um, the idea of just being a page in someone's diary and you'd, you'd be happy with that. Do you know what I mean? I think that definitely a lot of people could probably relate to that sort of longing of someone in school or something like that. You know what I mean? And you'd be like, I'd settle to be a footnote, just one page, just a brief mention. Do you know what I mean? That sort of thing. Um, yeah. I had a feeling that you would be into that. Um, 
Yeah. Uh, that that sounds like quite a sort of Peli Manta esque yeah. sort of um, it, idea for a song, I think. Well, I think a real good concept there. There's a, another one that I put out because, um, yeah, so a state sale, which is that instrumental in the middle. Um, just because it was like he, I think he used to love basically making these sort of sound collages and all that sort of stuff when he was a real kid. And you can kind of see that coming through in that tune, you know what I mean? Um, as the more electronic edge, did that speak to you at all? Yeah, I mean, uh, it's not, I wouldn't say it's one that I picked out, but they are quite good at sticking out, at sticking little, um, yeah, just little interesting uh Skits and moments, yeah, sort of. Yeah, I mean, yeah, even sound the design bit that in mysteries, there. beautiful blues. There's it's like twenty seconds silence, and then like mm-hmm. I don't Reversy know, stuff. Another ten of like yeah, soundscapey sort of stuff, you know. Yeah, um, yeah. It's quite an interesting, like even the soundscapey stuff that he does. It feels quite. There's something a little bit like retro about it. It doesn't, it feels like something that, um, I don't know. I feel like quite a lot of this album is a little bit Beatles-y, even though his voice is not at all like them. I wonder whether the the intro is like a, a nod to the Beatles, like the brass band doing like a little... Yeah, um, Badger Peppers-esque. Yeah. Um, in terms and of the I melody. feel like, yeah, the instrumental stuff. And, and uh, another from the production side, like a... An instrument that they use um, is the mellotron. Um, quite yeah. a lot of like flutes and strings from the mellotron, um, which probably is effect. It was as influenced to kill a king because we've used me- mellotron sounds quite a bit. Yeah. Um, but yeah, and that was like famously a Beatles sort quite of. Beatles, this, yeah. 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 When you were talking about the, the sounding a bit like the Beatles, I mean the melodies and stuff, they're all. They're, all like quite simple, very catchy, but it's the fact that he delivers it in almost like a um, spoken, half-spoken drawl sort of thing that makes it sound less, you know, yeah, like yeah, yeah. Uh, less instantly catchy, if you know what I mean. Like the bare bones of it is really like some of it could be like nursery rhyme, do you know what I mean? It's like uh, um, like in a really good way. It's really hard to find something that's that catchy. Um, but yeah, it's the fact that he like hardly sings, you know, it's... Um, I mean, so yeah, as a vocalist, I mean, just, I think we both always just love people who've got like a unique voice that you're not hearing everywhere else. And he was definitely one for me that I was like, yeah, he's, you know, not something I'd heard before at that point. Yeah. And he's, he's nice. Um, on, he's nice on the falsetto as well. Oh yeah. I think one of my favorite songs, the one of the ones that I like, I was saying earlier that there's a couple of songs that i go back to and daisies of the galaxy is one of those and that kind of like drifts off into this like falsetto um sort of dreaminess and the, he's just ooing um for like the last minute or so and yeah. uh I, I yeah i love that i think i think that's amazing that section i just want it on i want it to kind of want it to go on for for like three minutes but um yeah i love that bit um, yeah, it's sort of return of the grandeur of the orchestra there as well, which is really yeah. nice. Um, I've also got down here like Fly Swatter, um, which like I just love that, that. I think it's like songs like that, um, which set the album apart from from other sort of beautiful, more acoustic records. Because it almost sounds a bit like something like like Danny Elfman would do. You know what I mean? Like, um, yeah, like sort of like off kilter, but yeah. Yeah, wonderful. Um, what's the other one? It was oh, and Tiger in my tank again, a bit like that. Um, oh, I've also it was another little thing I picked up in his um, autobiography. George W. Bush put Tiger on my tank on one of the things that he was like, "These songs are corrupting America's youth," and it was no all way. There, which I think is a that's a claim to fame right there. George W. Bush <laughs> saying that you're corrupting America's youth. What is it? What's why is that offensive? Got a that line song? in it that says, um, "When I grow up, I'll be an angry little whore." Okay, uh, right. And they took it as face value that he was trying to get. The other argument was that because the front cover of this one is kind of a bit like a, um, it's almost like a kids book. So yeah, like, yeah. You know what I mean? And so they were like, he's trying to lure kids in, and then he's going to try and make them become little whores. Uh, it's George W. Bush. 
<laughs> I um I was never into like I wasn't really into metal when I was a, a teenager, but I've I went through like a corn listening phase recently. Okay. Um, quite recently, and I uh, yeah. I think one of their albums is like done like a kids book um yeah. and it's got i wonder which one came first because it's got like a young girl like running along i wonder what wonder, wonder whether daisies of the galaxy came before that corn record hey, man. um yeah um been a trend we can't get too sidetracked but i do have to ask why have you been listening to a bit of corn um i just uh i was just curious really curious just... you're a corn <laughs> yeah <of course>. curious <laughs> um of that, of that era, you know, when you're saying like, because I liked them when I was growing up, um, I, yeah, I can't go back to them. But do you know at the drive-in? Right. Okay. And I, I don't, I've never really seen uh, them so much. But. They're one of those ones where it's like, I'll listen to their album and be like, wow, they were really onto something. Do you know I mean? Just amazing stuff. Um, yeah. But not so much corn anymore. No, no, no. Those days behind me. I thought it was quite cool. Turned out you were wearing, so you've got quite a nice sort of, you know, cardigan, but on the back was a. Yeah, was yeah a cool. On. Yeah. So. <laughs> I'd written it on myself out written in Tip yeah. X. Yeah. <laughs> a sort of cro- crocheted one. <laughs> yeah. Um, get, hey, if you did back away from corn to back to. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, just in case we end up spending 20, like 30 minutes talking about corn. <laughs> um, and that, there's some interest, like, particularly, like, I think it was. Sitting back and just even you to speak about um about eel about eels and um like particularly the, some of the songs and stuff um one of the things that one of the things I kind of picked up was particularly when I think he was talking about the um forgive me if I get the pronunciation of the instrument wrong the mellotron is that correct yeah and he yeah, said mellotron, that he kind of, yeah. and he said that he influenced and he influenced the killer king so I mean how much so how much of this do you think actually influenced the sound of killer king? Killer King. I mean, was this something that was you listened to perhaps during the time of that first album, or was it something that was picked no, up? No, it was definitely or? earlier. So yeah, we um for me it was definitely started like teenage years. But I mean, I think it did um just that sort of creativity and wanting to try things and feeling like you could try things. Do you know what I mean? Um, is something that I think he's he's sort of given me um over the years. Um, yeah. Where you been? Yeah, I mean, definitely, uh, I can't, I wouldn't say there's like any like overt um, Eels references. Um, I think that everything you listen to like goes into what you, um, what you record and what you write. I'd say they're definitely in the same ballpark. Like I wouldn't, I would, I would say that in terms of like guitar led, um you know lyrical uh sort of yeah just kind of band um that i wouldn't i wouldn't i would i can imagine us being on the same like listeners of this might like kind of thing oh, yeah you know what i mean i thought you were going to say the same bill and i was like oh yeah i'd imagine that too <laughs> yeah okay well i would imagine the same, same imagine bill. that together huh and I guess, I, t- like I say, some of the uh, some of To Kill a King has got a bit of an am- Americana feel to it, um, and this I would say has got Americana influences. Yeah, quite strong uh, Americana influences on some of them. Hmm. Um, I, well, you can. T- I would say that it's like he's probably building his songs up with sort of like strong country roots. Do you know what I mean? And that's where you're getting that sort of Americana edge. And with us. It's kind of there's as the older I'm getting, it's getting a little bit more country. But to begin with, it was definitely more kind of like English folk roots, you know what I mean? So it's like you could see you can see them sort of they're two sides of the same coin, that sort of way, you know what I mean? I had a quick look at the fans also like on Spotify, actually, mm-hmm. when you mentioned that. And I did correct unfortunately clicking isn't on there, um, unfortunately. No, but um but but you've got bands like the Dandy Warhols. Mm-hmm. Juice, uh, the the little D in the capital E S U, Valley Drawn Boy. Beck, The Flaming yeah. Lips, Bella Sebastian, Wilco, Sparkle Horse, PJ Harvey, Black Rebel Motorcycle Club, Club uh, Nick Cave, Yola Tango, Supergrass, Nada Surf, um, Pavements, which, yeah, yeah um, like, the hell of a list, right? 
yeah, I, I can I can definitely see what I can definitely see elements of those bands in this, particularly in the album itself. And yeah, so the as I think I said earlier that I was quite surprised. I was quite surprised by it. I was expecting either something slightly more folky or acoustic based, and I got something that's all that's had a lot more electronic almost samples in it, mixed in with the with the acoustic singer songwriter mentality like it is like a case that if someone took found like a, a cd of a singer songwriter's demos and then decided to put other uh, basically slightly messing around with ni- like 90s trip hop <laughs> sampling totally it, yeah it. it's quite often it's just it will be like the drums um that sound like kind of almost like uh slowed down in the same way that like boom bap hip hop kind of it sounds like a a drum break that has been slowed down and looped um and and then he kind of puts guitars um and it, nice things like a, it's uh, very pe- lap steel pedal steel over the yeah. top yeah. of that it's very I, much um well the impression i got from it particularly that kind of sound is that it, it feels like it's stuff that's played over the credits of tv episodes <laughs> so like when there's been like a comedy drama where it's not like a sitcom but like comedy drama where there's either been like either cliffhanger or a kind of obtuse or kind of weird ending of it of it of, a, of a, like an American TV show. This feels like some there's quite a few songs that feel like they'll play over the end credits to try and carry on that kind of feeling of like unease or like mm. that kind of you're not sure what kind of emotion to feel. Which I think which I think has that kind. Of, is this album to T where you've got like, oh, sh- should you be feeling quite distraught at the lyrics? But then should you actually be like, <laughs> like as I was doing, on, on, yeah, bopping your head along to the actual beat and stuff, where it's like going, we're going to die one day. La, 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 yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> Might as well have a dance if we're going to die one yes. day. Um, so, yeah, no, I mean, I think in terms of his sort of, when I talk about him as sort of like DIY songwriter, <clears throat> It's sort of the, I think he would basically write with whatever he can get his hands on. And so like with the way you're describing him using those loops and stuff, I kind of always get the impression that he probably started doing that because he didn't have a drummer. Do you know yeah. what I mean? It's sort of like, um, and then at this stage, he suddenly is like, oh, I can actually afford to bring in some brass. Do you know what I mean? So it's like, it's almost like a new little toy that he's playing with, but it's like a, happens to be like a four piece brass band or whatever, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. Uh, I was just going to say like a little a little theme that happens quite a lot in Eel songs from the production side is that they he like it's kind of it's not nothing too crazy in ter- in terms of the general arrangement in terms of like what's going on you know bass guitar some keys um, but then he will quite often like in the gaps in the vocals like whack in like some weird sort of manipulated samples so there's it'll be you know there'll be like a he'll be singing for like a couple of bars and then there'll be two bars of break and they'll just there'll be just some weird sample that changes each time it's not like a repeating thing um it's like something listening back to it. i was like oh yeah that's quite that's quite a cool technique quite often it'll it'll be used to like add a bit of interest to like the second verse so the first verse will be quite straight and then the second one it'll just whack in some like slightly weird um melodic like twiddles on like reverse sounds and things like that um I, yeah I, I was you were chatting about the production stuff i suddenly ha- did have a think about stuff we might have borrowed from them in terms of sound um and i think one thing we do quite often is have a sampled quite obvious choir and we add our own high use to it, which is he does quite a lot. I think I definitely took that from them. There are Mellotron samples uh, that are like like some of the original Mellotron sounds were choirs. I don't know if yeah. Um, it, would your listeners like me to explain what a me- what a Mellotron is and how it works? Oh, please. Then. Yes, please. I'm. I'm not. Yeah. I'm, I've often marked myself as an idiot, so I'm not. The, so well, I've. The, yeah. The so nice thing about this one is that it because it used to be an old mechanical machine. You'll be able to visualize it quite well. You know what I mean? Yeah. So go on. Yeah, so it's like it's basically like one of the earliest ways of doing sampling is um, because obviously these days it's all like the samples are digitally stored on you know a hard drive or whatever. But before you could do that, obviously the only way that you could 
uh, do it was literally record. So they would record like an orchestra playing A, B, C, D, E, F, G and record that onto tape. And then you'd have the tape in a loop. And then a keyboard was like literally just push, you press the buttons on the keyboard and it's like literally just connecting a tape head to each of these loops of tape that's going around. So it's literally just like playing different tapes and you have yeah. these huge cassettes that they would load in so this is like your the flute sound which is like the strawberry fields like mm -hmm. flute sound um so when, so when was this was it 60s then or? um yeah i reckon around 60s yeah yeah i i've got a feeling they probably had it before that but that's yeah. when it came into like popular use do you know what i mean so they're all quite sort of wonky and like the because they're running like however many tapes uh, you know like maybe 24 tapes at the same time there's loads of noise and warble on the tapes like they all they all, all the pitching sounds a bit wonky yeah. also you have to be a lot more decisive in which one you wanted so if you were like trying the flutes and then you're like actually we'll have choirs it would take people like i don't know <laughs> like an hour to change over or something like yeah. that yeah yeah actually flutes again um <laughs> <laughs> uh yeah but yeah you've got like flute strings Choirs, they're all like classic sounds that you would instantly recognize if you heard them, if you heard them yeah wow well, that's quite interesting uh, i always got a fascination with kind of like um particularly older computer equipment so i was i was quite fascinated with that anyway so i've been to quite a few of the like uh computer museums around the country looking at some of the older kind of retro stuff and stuff but i've never really kind of looked at the older recording section so that kind of stuff's quite fascinating Particularly like how they have to, how they, how that how like how they manage to do things that we probably take that we take for granted in the modern world. But yeah, so I mean, I mean, have you have you have you personally ever sort of been? Have you personally ever used any of the older style recording techniques? So have you have you had a chance to to use? Um, I mean, vintage microphones are always quite fun to use. Like they the older microphones that they would have used, uh, uh, ribbon microphones and. They're still used like uh, quite a lot today. Like they're used for drum overheads and sometimes vocals and guitar cabs and stuff. They're just like not quite as hi-fi and add a little bit of crunch and take the top end off in a nice way. So we'll, we'll quite often also record stuff onto tape and then back onto digital because that again just gives it that sort of yeah slight sort of uh, sometimes a bit of a wobble but also a bit of the hiss and that sort of thing, a bit of the warmth. That you get from that sort of thing um i guess like now though you just live in an age where you you can pick and choose to you know what i mean to you know you've got all those sort of ease of the of the modern plugins and that sort of stuff but you can also rely on the other stuff if you want to kind of you know that sort of sound um yeah there is also something which like talking about him where it's like writing with the instruments that you've got i think now the fact that you kind of have you could have almost any instrument or you've, you know, got infinite possibilities. I think sometimes in writing that can be uh, a bit of a drawback as well. Do you know what I mean? Like you could be like, we could add absolutely everything in the kitchen sink on this one track. And then that can almost become sort of um, detrimental to you. You know what I mean? So it's quite nice to almost pretend like you have a limited amount of choices, you know? Oh, okay. I mean, have you, have you, ever entertain thoughts of trying to do something completely analog or... i feel like we've done some we might have done like a couple of s releases that will we did deliberately just do them on a four track tape uh machine um and let's have a look i'm trying to think i guess that's it really recording yeah on a on an old four track is we yeah we've got a couple of i think we've got at least one release that's like that we we will do little sections though where we'll go from like say a big sort of fully produced you know um, sound to then maybe just a bunch of us around one microphone and then you sort of go from just that everyone harmonizing around the one mic me on the guitar and it's very live and then suddenly you click into the fully sort of produced track and that that's something that's one of our little tricks isn't yeah it? yeah yeah we got a song called Oh My Love uh, oh, yeah. which yeah you get like a very distinctive sound from like if someone's in a in a small room i'll just do it now if you if you're in a small room and you're off microphone you can you can definitely hear that so if you go from like a big loud production 
um, into that feeling. It really like snaps you into like reality. And then if yeah. you go between those two, it can be really effective. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Oh, wow. That's, that was really quite interesting. Um, I think so. Going back to kind of the songs for a second. So, yeah, I mean, I was, I was quite, I was quite surprised. I was, I, I, I ended up really quite liking the album. So it was the first, so I have actually only listened to it for the first time today, um, this morning, but I managed to, I managed to, fit, I managed to listen to it twice, um, uh, basically on the commutes, um, to work and from work, uh, which, which, and, yeah, and, and like, <laughs> as, and as a joke, and as a joke before, it was like, uh, you got kind of like these kind of, it's probably not the best album to listen to on the way to work. <laughs> 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 yeah, but um, it's a lot. I found it a very kind of interesting, um, particularly with that like the contrast between the like the de- like the depressive, the darker kind of introspective stuff, and the kind of more interesting kind of like almost upbeat, but not like just off the center of upbeat tracks and stuff. And the the again, like I said, I like birds, which has kind of has that kind of weird quirkiness to it. Um, I really like the sound of fear. Which I don't mm. know what to talk about. I, I, because I, when that, that, when that started playing, I was like, I, I was, I was really getting into that as a song. I thought I was really enjoying that. Um, so I think it was one of the songs that you, that you both didn't really speak about that much. So what, what did you think of the sound of, the sound of fear? Yeah. I mean, I, again, I think I'd put that with the sort of, uh, tiger in my tank, but with the ones that elevates it away from being, um, a very beautiful, but very sort of acoustic one. It's like, it's a great moment. And, um, yeah, love that one. Yeah, some cool organy bits on there. Um, yeah, just, oh, it's also I guess that, it's groovy. Yeah, it's also the bit where it's like for the album, it's like the third track, and it's where it really changes gear because you have this sort of a, you know big brass opening, and then it goes into a really nice acoustic song, and then suddenly you get um, that keys part, as you say, kind of quite groovy, and then the beat comes in, and it's like you're like, oh, where are we going now? Um, so I love it. Yeah, it's like a new flavor on the album. Is that the one that he goes? Uh, that's real nice at the end. I think it's just like grooving away, and he's like, "That's real nice." And I kind of have that. <laughs> I I think I quote that like quite. I, I I will often quote that, but not even realize where I've quoted it from, and no one <laughs> around me knows what I'm quoting it from. But I'll just be like, "That's real nice." I think that's what he says. <laughs> um. Yeah. I just need. I just want to quickly. Shares of that song. I like that one. Yeah, I really quite like that one. Yeah, and again, um, and, and it's quite interesting that you kind of like it's Tiger in My Tank because I really quite like Tiger in My Tank as well because it's got because it kind of does some. It's got that interesting, like that was that samples and that um that underlying. So what what could easily just be like a, a singer songwriter song, but with that kind of weird almost mm. dance, like almost like lo-fi dance. I think yeah, I think trip hop. What you said, trip hop was quite a quite um, good description of it, and I guess it was probably around that sort of time that trip hop was having its moment. Yeah, yeah. I wouldn't describe it as a trip hop trip hop record, but yeah, it's um, it's got like influences, especially in the in the beats. Yeah, de- yeah, definitely, definitely. But, um, but yeah, I just I, I just I just wanted to just raise that song before we move on stuff so i was i just thought it was quite quite interesting um on the actual reception of the album itself itself it received, gem- received generally favorable response from critics um so yes yeah, so we've got a minus in entertainment weekly three out of five in the guardian uh three and a half out of four with los angeles times four out of five for the melody maker nine out of ten for the enemy four out of five for q Ronnie stone three and a half spin gave it six out of ten uncut gave it four um yeah so it's Generally, like in the the higher end of the critic stuff, um, could not find a pitchfork review. Which is, <laughs> which is uh-huh. like, I mean, I was really, I was really, there must be one somewhere, unless I've just not found it. Hot, I don't know. Pitchfork, I went, do you know when pitchfork started? Yeah, I think it was like pre uh, this is like pre internet times, wasn't it? 2000, the album came out. I don't know when pitchfork was around, but yeah, I would, I would, or at least, particularly with some, particularly with um, older bands or longer running bands, they've usually gone and done retrospective interviews. Uh, um, yeah. yeah, so I'm surprised they've not touched Eels. Um, but yeah, I think that's um, kind of like interesting mix of um, some of the higher stuff. Um, I'm not surprised Enemy gave it nine out of ten. 
this feels like a very enemy album. This has got a lot of this has got plenty of indie crossover. Um indie crossover. Um at some point I think there are some at some points, particularly in the first half of the album, I was listening to this and um perhaps some of the more acoustic songwriting bits um are very very recently um at the time of recording it's not aired yet but the next episode of the podcast will be covering frightened rabbits midnight organ fight and there are parts of this i could listen to this i was like i could kind of see potentially where some of frightened rabbit picked up like either like the combination of like what well, the dark what well, the dark kind of dark sing songwriting and perhaps some of the electronic stuff in it so i could feel that like that probably scott hutchinson probably might have been influenced by this. So I can see the lineage for that, um, which I thought was quite fun to... I was just going, oh, I could... I could, I could That's an it. interesting comparison because like, when, when To Kill a King were like um, first launching, like we got... Frightened Rabbit was like a band that we got compared to a lot. Mm. Um, so yeah, maybe, maybe there's something in that. Um, yeah, I only, so I, I only bring that up because it's just I only re- very recently just listened to it because of the podcast and stuff. So I just so it was quite fresh in my mind, and I was like, oh, there's a lot of there's, I can kind of see lineage for that in terms of like its performance in the charts. Um, it got so I think it didn't do didn't like blow the charts away, but it its highest chart positions was in the UK and Belgium of all places where they got eight eighth got to number eight. Uh, yeah, twenty one in Norway, twenty four in Ireland. Uh, 34th in Holland, 38th in Australia, um, and around the 40s in mainland Europe. And it went gold in the UK. So, yeah, got 100,000 sold. Uh, went gold in Belgium and Australia. Couldn't find any US sales for it, though. So, uh, but... Yeah, yeah so I'd say in, in general, like, Eels are one of those bands where, like, I think if you if you like them, I don't know if you feel the same... Ralph, but you like you get Eels fans that and and they just produce so much stuff that quite often I'll be like listening to their albums and be like, if I had one one criticism of Eels, it's like he it's it's almost like he finds writing good songs effortless, um and so they kind of quite quite often you can like listen to them and it's just like it's it almost seems too easy. Um, but then there will always be like one or two songs that you're like that they just catch you and it might be a different different for each people each person which ones that is but um, yeah definitely on this on this album there's like there's a couple of songs like the, the one daisies of the galaxy that just caught me in the right time and it and yeah I can understand why it's not like it's not like blowing the charts uh, away. It wasn't like a massive deal at the time, but it's just like just just a few. It just takes a few songs to like really make an impact on people, fans. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I would think in terms of legacy, they. I don't think they've ever really like, as Ben says, like sold a load of records. And I'm going to say here something based on no facts whatsoever, but just a just a feeling that I've got. But I would say that like maybe the percentage of people that got into eels when me and ben did and then ended up forming bands is probably much higher than other bands necessarily do you know what i mean i think they're and i think maybe their legacy is a bit in the other or the other bands that formed from from you know the little spark that they gave um you know because you do get those sort of those ones that it's like the next comes the next comers that kind of you know, really do all the stuff. But also I really admired that. I mean, I think because it is a bit of his sort of therapy thing, I can imagine he's never going to stop writing, but I do admire he'll seem to just keep on. And you know that there's an album, because some of them are really big, you know what I mean? They're like, particularly when he starts doing the double ones and stuff like that, but you know that he's probably got like 30 tracks or something like that on the double album, but there was probably a hundred that he wrote, you know what I mean? he's He's definitely that sort of, I think he loves doing it. That's what he does. Bare time he goes into probably now a very nice basement, but a basement nonetheless, and sits down and writes. Do you know what I mean? I think that's his his thing. So, yeah. Ah, Okay. Um, So you say there's been a couple of times, particularly with artists. um, Well, I'm talking about some artists 
some artists on the podcast where it seems like a band seems to be more for other musicians rather than fans. So, or like, so the biggest example I've got is when all the way back, like several years ago now, talking about Jimmy Eat World when we did the album Clarity, where it seemed like that album was for musicians that influenced the new wave of emo, whereas then Lead American came out and that was for the fans. So you got like, do you think Eels were, do you think Eels might be a band that's perhaps more for musicians than perhaps the public or? Uh-huh. Well, yeah, I don't know. Like, I mean, I because I think yeah, it, no clue. It's hard to tell, isn't it? Because you mentioned that you mentioned about like it seemed quite like it might be influencing a bunch of stuff that came around like when you first guys started as well. I think yeah, it seemed like the, particularly when you was when when we were talking about Frightened Rabbit, I was wondering whether it, this might be whether eels might be something that be thrown around as an influence by other by, yeah. by your contemporaries. I mean, it's it's definitely just a feeling, but I kind of just feel like yeah. Might or there might be like a more majority of Eels fans that have one point formed a band or <laughs> been inspired to do that. Do you know what I mean? Whether yeah. they make it or not. Um, yeah, I think I think that's it. I there could be definitely something in that when I was saying at the start about the fact that it feels like music does sub- an amazing quality, but it also feels accessible. It feels like something that you could that's how it makes me feel anyway. Like, oh, I could go out and do this. Maybe something in what you just said, Ben, about how you like, he writes these perfect songs, but it feels too easy almost. You're like, I could do that, right? <laughs> yeah. It's like C, G, and D. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, man, it's someone that I just completely admire. I really do think. Yeah, and yeah. As a person as well, I say from reading his autobiography, the way that he can face all these tragedies and sort of, still look at for the good things in life and have this sort of sense of humor he does seem like a good guy <laughs> you know what i mean uh so yeah yeah okay so um have you ever seen eels live um I, yeah we've seen him a couple of times but actually me and ben i think ben had a spare ticket so you took me along didn't you one yeah time? yeah yeah well, was, that was bricks was it brixton? yeah <laughs> it was brixton wasn't um, it yeah yeah, I, one of the things that I love about him, seeing him live, is that he always seems to bring along a different band. I think there's a core couple that seems to always be there. So I've seen him where he's got like, um, or like you know, slide guitar, bass, drums, keys, and all that sort of stuff. And then I've also seen him where it's just literally him, a bass player, and a drummer. Um, and so, yeah, and, and he'll adapt the songs accordingly. So like again that you know that like i like birds one i think when me and ben saw him that song lasted about one minute because he played it ferociously like a punk band do you know what i mean um and it was brilliant though it absolutely it just, just yeah but it was over so fast um and I, I also love that about him and yeah it's i going back to that thing where you're talking about like the things that you've taken from him i think also that is something that we do as well whether it's directly from him or just other bands that we like like that where you're like always looking for the best way to perform a track not necessarily doing it exactly how it is on the record but just how how you know how it feels and how best you can do it for that tour um which is something i i love when other bands do it i i'm probably some people who hate it when people play things differently but yeah i like it Ah, okay, so what about you, Ben? Um, have you got any memories? Of, any memories that stand out when you've seen him live? Or um, yeah, I just remember. I'm I remember enjoying it. It's the first. I mean, I've been a fan of them for like I don't know what whatever it is. Nearly, uh, I don't know, probably like nearly twenty years or something at the time. So, um, not that long, but n- nearly that long. And uh, I felt it's the only, it's the first time I'd ever seen them live. Um, which was and yeah, they didn't. Wait, was that with me? That was the first. Yeah, time. yeah, that's the first time uh, I've seen them. Yeah. yeah, um, but I've got a story about the. F- what I actually had tickets to see them when I was a kid. Um, and basically, I can't. I can't remember the exact details, but basically, what happened was my mum. I think it was on the night that I was meant to go. Um. I normally would have had like football practice. But on this particular night, I had a detention and I didn't tell my mum that I had a detention. I, she just thought I was at football practice. But then she realised, oh, 
I've, uh, we've got tickets to see Eels because she was, you know, I was too young to like go on my own at that time. So I was, I'll take. Uh, so she came to the school, went to the football pitches to pick me up and uh, I wasn't there and all and like all the kids were like oh no he's in detention tonight and then I sort of saw my mum's face appear at the window <laughs> and she took me out of detention um, but she was so like furious that we didn't go to the gig she just gave up the tickets yeah I was it was we had to just like go home she was like furious oh, with me. um can you tell us what you did what uh what to get the detention yeah um probably just being a bit of a prick <laughs> i don't know I wasn't... just generally being a prick <laughs> yeah probably just like <laughs> laughing um, um i can't imagine kind of young bad. young ben being a prick um i was i kind of used to be in detention a fair bit just just it... not, not for like anything cool just for being slightly annoying um and like not being able to stop laughing and like making yeah. noise and stuff like that um yeah or not remembering to do homework. Um, but yeah, it's probably something like that. <laughs> <laughs> wow. That's the first, I think that's the first time that someone said that they missed the gig because there was an detention, because they had detention. Yeah, they had a detention, yeah. <laughs> yeah, wow. <laughs> um, so, okay, so people have listened to uh, Days of the Galaxy and they want to perhaps venture off onto other parts of EO's discography. Where do you recommend that they go to next? Um, I would say either forward or back one. So uh, Beautiful Freak is is a fantastic album. And I was kind of torn between that and this one, really. So I think that's his first one. And it's got there's the one that people would know, definitely, because it's in the Shrek one, is My Beloved Monster and Me. Um, and that's just a beautiful song. Um, but it's full of beautiful songs in that one. Um, and then the other one that I really love is Soul Jacker which I think is the one that he does directly after this one. Um, I think that one like pushes more into the sort of, in fact, you might like it more because it kind of pushes more into the sort of fly swatter, um, sort of more, more sort of groovy, heavier sort of stuff. Uh, it never gets that heavy, but a little bit heavier. Do you know what I mean? Um, it's more of that. And then the sort of ballady ones become more of the, there's maybe two or three little ballady ones rather than it be mostly ballady with the odd sort of heaviest thing so it kind of inverts it for that one um but yeah but th those are and that's kind of my era of eels that i know well um is soul jack the one with the theme tune to that monkey yeah um yeah yeah he's uh did you ever watch a very weird um cartoon it was called it was monkey dust wasn't it no monkey dust what? yeah that's it monkey yeah yeah dust. oh really dark comedy there was one where for example it's a it's a, a dad who's looking after his son and he's divorced and then it always ends up with him the punchline is essentially him blowing his brains out every every episode yeah yeah I that sort of level of super dark they um, the theme that, tune for it i think so I'm, if it's the right one i'm pretty sure they had a very weird obsession with harold shipman as well yeah think, like, all, that, yeah all really dark stuff um it feels like the right kind of <laughs> artist to put a yeah on. yeah so yeah they anyway and yeah that's got that a theme tune to that song on it um what about you ben because i think you got yeah i really like there's there's an album they've got called um is it blinking lights or blinding lights and other revelations i think it's yeah i think it's blinding lights and that's, the, that's the double album isn't it so that's a, it's yeah it's a pretty um epically long one and uh, yeah. there's probably like i was saying earlier like there's it's like a lot of songs that i would give like a a six or a seven and then about three or four tens you know um but that's out of like i don't know i don't know 30 plus songs um yeah. but yeah they've got uh the whole thing out that ends with this thing this song called things the grandchildren should know which is like kind of like quite a long um it sounds yeah i mean it sounds like a it sounds like the last song he's ever going to release, but obviously he's now gone on to re release a hundred more songs, but it, that's what it sounds like. Um, that's what he's named his autobiography. Right. So what things that. the grandchildren should know. Yeah. Right. That's okay. What, yeah. But he, um, it, so he's, you're talking about like um, being put off by the vast number of songs. That's an album that has put me off because of the fact that it's like 
so long. Do you know what I mean? (laughs) Or like I've delved in and not, maybe not found that nugget straight away and then been like, oh, you know what I mean? It's uh, so no, I'll, you know, what? I'll take your advice. That's going to be my, there's a few that I can remember. I think that one, like lyrically, I've just, um, there's just a few really great moments in it. Like things the grandchildren should know was like, got this bit about his father where he's like, uh, um, there's like, he says, uh, I, I swear I, I, it turns out I'm, I'm turning out just like my father, although I swore I never would. Um, I've got love for him now, things I never really understood. Um, and he's kind of like forgiving his dad for being a shit dad, basically. Yeah. Um, and then he's got a song, which is like an upbeat sort of like, um, <clears throat> it's like an an upbeat like the, the the more groovy ones called Hey Man, Now You're Really Living, which is like all claps and like, Hey Man. Oh, I know that it? song, yeah. And it's, but it's yeah. like, this is the new dance the kids are doing where they crawl up into the fetal position underneath their desk and like. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. He's definitely got, um, and when you see him live, actually, he's genuinely very funny. You know what I mean? He, uh, yeah, he'll do like odd little dances and things like that. Um, like knowingly funny yeah okay so quite a few options to choose from depending on which on which way you want to go um so we as we are gearing up to the end of our chat and we're now at the very 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 important and perhaps the most important question of the podcast which is the song for the spotify hall of fame playlist now for anyone listening who's not um listened before what this means i'm going to ask ben and ralph to pick one song that is good one song between them um, to be immortalized forever on the Spotify Hall of Fame playlist. I can't be to it, so whatever they choose, go. So, Ben, Ralph, you're gonna you're gonna have a comp. You need to have. We've a- not discussed this. <laughs> no, we haven't. No. We'll have to. I mean, there's a there's a couple I'd go for, but I would say, um, I've got a feeling that it would be I like birds. So, yeah, yeah. I yeah. Mean, that's one that we both like. All the all the beautiful blues. Because I think my favourite yeah. ones are not your favourites, and your your absolute favourites aren't my favourites. But I think that we would both let, agree. Let's, on. let's do this properly. Like, which which would be your absolute favourite? I would put, probably put Daisy the Gal- get Daisies of the Galaxy uh, on. Okay. Yeah, I see. I mean, no, I really um, like that one. I don't think so. it's also. I kind of want to draw people in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In I want I want him to be like phone is up. Hey man, you're getting on the bill because. <laughs> You were on that podcast, and then you drew in so many more fans. Oh, my word. Um, so I'd go for, yeah, probably like I Like Birds. But, yeah, yeah. yeah. Are you okay with that one? I'm okay with I Like Birds. Yeah, yeah, you can okay. do that. All right, let's do that then. Yeah. Okay, so I Like Birds. Follows on, um, follows on to the podcast following a bunch of songs that I can't add because we haven't recorded those episodes yet because they're a part of the uh fifth birthday celebrations that I've not recorded yet so uh so I can't usually do what I usually do and say what it follows on but uh, <laughs> but before then it will follow um Frightened Rabbit and Paul Simon so uh oh. so among good company <laughs> so but um okay. yeah so we are now at the very end of our chat and so I want to say thank you for Ben and Ralph to, for coming on uh, I want to shout out Hannah at Lash Media as well for for bring us together um so but now we're at the end of our conversation i want to say ben and ralph thank you ever so much for donating thanks um, for having us for for donating a very cold wednesday evening um to talk to just basically talk uh, about eels um but before you go if people want to find you online where can they find you and to kill a king uh well uh, we are touring. We're doing like a, our first album was called Cannibals with Cutlery, um, and we're doing like a tenth anniversary tour. Um, so come and check us out live. Uh, we're doing we like a UK doing tour. Our ten year anniversary tour, eleven years after we put it out, which is typical for us. Yeah, it's, yeah. <laughs> sort of fashionably uh, late. Sort of thing you get when you get us. Yeah. <laughs> One year um, so yeah like manchester leeds nottingham um at the end of january basically um mm-hmm. Brist- bristol brighton and london at the beginning of february yeah so it's just a couple of weeks away that tour is so uh yes yeah, yes yeah, so do come along it's going to be great fun yeah yeah and um yeah so go and give um to kill a king a follow uh and give him a listen and if you are around those time, around the gigs at those times, go and, go and say hello. And if 
and yeah, and if you're listening, if you do go because of this, tell them that Matt from Biggity said hi. Um, <laughs> but um, so yeah, keep yelling it out sporadically <laughs> during the gig. <laughs> yeah, actually, I'll just keep, I'll just keep chasing play. I like birds. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Do like a really random heckles. Like it's one, one person in one, one person in one of the gigs just chasing. I like birds. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, thank you ever so much. Ben, thank you ever so much, Ralph, for coming on and introducing me to Eels. No worries. No problem. Yeah. Um, thanks very much for having us. Yeah, cheers, mate. You've been listening to Pick a Disc, and I've been your host, Matthew Laver. Our theme music is Pump by Kevin McLeod of Incompetech.com. Pick a Disc is hosted by the We Made Disc Podcast Network, and you can find them on www.spreaker.com slash user slash We Made This. You can find the Pick a Disc show site on www.spreaker.com slash show slash Pick a Disc. You can find us on all the usual social media type places like Facebook, Instagram, Twitter under Pick a Disc. You can also email us on pickadisc at gmail.com. Until next time, happy listening to all those discs that you are picking. Goodbye. Do you know your Daleks from your Drashigs? Or your Zygons from your Zagreus? Do you know what the TARDIS stands for? And do you know which Doctor Who stories featured Kevin Grimlock, the cyborg T-Rex that became the Doctor's companion? Then this is a Doctor Who podcast for you. I'm Baz Green and in each fortnight I chat to my son Ben. Hello. And the occasional guest as we cover 60 years of Doctor Who on TV. Big finish and more. And I did really enjoy that one. Except that wasn't really actual pirates, it was badger pirates in space, but it was still piratey. Badger pirates in space? Yes. But I am willing to make an exception for pirates in this episode. Uh, Donald Sumter uh, is amazing. I love the fact that he's just, he just pops up. He just pops up, probably Rassilon, probably. Well, uh, they do confirm later on he is. I think they do. Yeah, he says on Rassilon the Redeemer. Of course he does, bloody hell. And he has, the, he has the gauntlet as well, which gives the hint of that. Yeah. I'm nodding profusely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We're, yeah. We're, we're, we're proper classic dots here as well, a lot of it as well. Yes. All. In a week has done more of the show than for the last five years. I, I do like how uh, Ross Z. Davis is kind of the PR spokesman for the Centurion special. That's quite fun. Yeah. And he's also saying, oh, well, Jodie and Chibnall still have an episode left. I'm not going to tread on their feet, but he is 14, just so you know, for the filming purposes. And a week later, oh, yeah, yeah, by the way, these guys are back. Just thought you'd want to know. Find us on the We Made This Network. And all good podcast providers. What about the bad ones? Yes, them too. Ah, good. Because somewhere there's danger. Somewhere there's injustice. Somewhere else, the tea's getting cold. You know, we probably should throw that tea away now. It has been sat there since 1989.